Hi students and welcome back to the online Sunday school class. Since the last lesson we have seen how Saul was rejected as the king of Israel and God now appointed David to be the new king. Where we see David's rising popularity among the people and Saul becoming jealous of David and trying many times to kill him. But David always managed to escape with God's help. In today's lesson, we see how King David is ready to take over the reins of ruling over both Israel and Judah, unifying them to make them a strong empire. You have seen the Indian map. Don't you think our country is very vast with many states in it? Don't we face many problems of people of different types fighting one another? Should the country be divided? How would you divide the country? Let us now see a short video on how India looked at the time of independence. For centuries, monarchs ruled the Indian subcontinent. Vast empires emerged over time and a few rulers left lasting impressions of their legacy in the region. Even under British occupation, Feudal rule by natives endured, but by the 20th century, things began to change. In 1947, British India was about to become independent and split into two countries. Scattered between the two regions were 565 princely states. Each state had a native ruler who held on to immense wealth and power. Some rulers were determined to hold on to their power when the British left, but India and Pakistan had other plans. They wanted to end feudal rule and integrate the princely states to their territories. For many years, the British Empire grew its territory in the Indian subcontinent. Expansion was not easy, so the British developed alliances with some princely states. Many native rulers signed treaties with the British Empire, allowing them to remain autonomous. In return, the native rulers gave the British Empire supreme authority over the region. This system of rule was called paramountcy, and it allowed the native rulers to keep some of their power and wealth. By 1947, the British Empire started taking steps to declare British India independent. To handle this matter, Lord Mountbatten was placed in charge. Mountbatten supervised the breakup of British India. Under his watch, British India split into two countries. Paramount Sea also lapsed and the rulers of the princely states were given three choices. They could either join India, a secular Hindu majority country, Pakistan, a Muslim majority country, or they could remain independent. The Indian government could not afford to let the princely states remain independent. At the time of independence, 552 of the 565 princely states were within the Indian territory. Maintaining relations with so many small states would be impossible. 25% of the population lived in the princely states, and some of these states were very oppressive. It was important for the Indian government to integrate the princely states into India and give everyone a chance to live under democracy. To negotiate the merger of the princely states, the Indian government put Saradar Patel, the Deputy Prime Minister of India, and his right-hand man, VP Menon, in charge. To convince the native rulers to join India, the Indian government offered the rulers a privy purse. Privy purses were annual payments from the Indian government to each ruler for their part in integrating India. Most of the princely states were small and they could not govern themselves, so they joined India. However, three states in particular resisted. The princely state of Junagar had a Muslim ruler who ruled over a Hindu majority population. Junagar's ruler pledged to join Pakistan, even though his state's borders didn't align with it. Meanwhile, most of the Hindu population of Junagar wanted to stay in India. 
With rising internal conflict and pressure from the Indian government, Junigar held a plebiscite and the majority of the people voted to join India. The princely state of Hyderabad was the largest region in India. The ruler of Hyderabad, Mir Osman Ali Khan, was a Muslim, whilst his state had a Hindu majority population. During independence, Mir Osman Ali Khan was the richest man in the world, and his state was as large as other nation states in Europe. Hyderabad's ruler wanted to keep his power and wealth, so he chose to keep his state independent. After independence, a private army called the Razakars, led by a man called Qasim Razvi, started terrorizing the state. Their agenda was to integrate Hyderabad into Pakistan. The rising violence in Hyderabad gave the Indian government a reason to intervene. The Indian government launched Operation Polo. They entered the state with armed forces to stop the conflict. After a violent battle that claimed many lives, the Razukars were defeated and the ruler of Hyderabad reluctantly integrated his state into India. What are your views to the questions below? How do you think the Muslims and the Hindus must have felt? Is there any reason to consider dividing the country today? Let us now listen to the story of David. Welcome to the biblical game of thrones. It's 1100 BCE. The 12 tribes of Israel have settled the promised land, but have split into two separate, though closely related nations. In the south are the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. In the north are the ten remaining tribes. The ten northern tribes are known simply as Israel, and the two southern tribes are called the nation of Judah. While the impact of the united monarchy on human history is immeasurable, by itself it lasted all of 80 years. Finally, the time has come for King David to assume the throne. His men anoint him king of Judah. However, Saul's surviving son, Ishbosheth, declares himself the king of the north, or rather, the king of Israel. A civil war breaks out, and it drags on for years. Slowly, the kingdom of Israel weakens. King David and the kingdom of Judah grow stronger. The kingdom of Israel finally surrenders, and David is anointed both king of Judah and Israel. At last begins the united monarchy. The people have the king that they had hoped for in a united country spanning from north to south. King David takes over a Jebusite stronghold on a hard to reach hill, a small fortress town that might already have been known as Jerusalem. He declares it his new capital. He dissociates it from all the tribes so as not to play favorites, and there he builds his city of David. presence of God, David made a treaty with all the leaders of Israel, and they anointed David as their king. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he ruled for 40 years. David and his men immediately set out for Jerusalem to take on the Jebusites who lived there. When they arrived, the Jebusites mocked David and said, you should go home. Even the blind and the lame could keep you out. You can't get in here. They had convinced themselves that David couldn't break through. But David went right ahead and captured the fortress of Zion, known ever since as the city of David. David made the fortress city his home and developed it from the outside terraces inward. David grew greater and stronger because God, the Lord of the army of angels, was with him. As king of Israel, David carved out an empire, embarking on many campaigns, conquering the neighboring states of Moab, Edom, and Ammon, and the Armenian kingdoms of Zoab and Damascus. These conquered nations either ended control over their land or became David's subjects, paying taxes to him. Having subdued the Philistines, David gained control over the coastal trade routes, which meant plenty of business opportunities 
and increase in revenue. King David also began an efficient civil service to rule his people with fairness and justice. Services like a scribe, record keeper, a number of counselors, and even a personal bodyguard for his safety. The army, a key institution in his kingdom, was headed by a general. An organized clergy comprising of twenty-four classes of priests served the different tribes, presiding over religious services and rites. David the poet chanted the psalms with his harps at these services, some of which he wrote himself. The people enjoyed an era of peace and prosperity. He moves the tabernacle tent and the ark of the covenant to the new capital city. It is a glorious celebration. King David decided to move the ark to Jerusalem so that he could keep it safe. He gathered thirty thousand of Israel's best men to move it. They loaded the ark on a cart and pushed it all the way to Jerusalem. While they moved the ark, David and the men celebrated with all their might. As they traveled, they made a joyful noise to the Lord with. All kinds of noisemakers. As they brought the ark into the city of David, the streets were filled with shouts and the sound of trumpets. King David was so excited about the ark's arrival in his city that he was dancing in the streets in his underwear. His wife Michael saw this from a window and was unhappy with David's leaping and dancing before the Lord. David put the Ark of the Covenant in the place he had designated for it, and went home. When he got there, Michael was waiting for him. She was disappointed and angry. She told David that the king of Israel should know better than to dance around in the streets in his underwear. But David was not embarrassed. He told her that he was dancing for the Lord. He said it didn't matter what he was wearing; he would celebrate and be happy before the Lord. He didn't care what anybody said or what other people thought. King David was so happy that he couldn't contain it. He had to dance and celebrate all the Lord had done for him and his people. David. Through his military tactics and his organizational skills in administration, transformed Israel from a few loosely connected tribes to a flourishing united empire, stretching from the border of Egypt to the Euphrates. As God's representative, David was responsible not only for the political unity but also for the religious unity of the people of Israel. When David decided to install the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem, his capital he was linking the presence of god to that of his kingship in other words he was making known that the kings of israel enjoyed a special relationship with god for the purpose of bringing peace unity and prosperity to their people god teaches us that there is always prosperity in unity and we find strength to remain united by focusing our lives on god With the Ark of the Covenant firmly installed in Jerusalem, the city has now become the house of the Lord. Every year, the tribes made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. We have a couple of psalms called the Song of Ascents, which describe the feelings and sentiments of the people as they climbed up to their city of peace. One of them is sung often as the entrance hymn for our Sunday liturgy. Which one is it, children? I now want you to take a prayerful posture. Sit straight. Hands on your lap. Feet on the ground. Imagine King David with his eyes fixed on the city, situated on a hill, playing his harp, and making the ascent to the house of God. The people join him in the procession with tambourines and cymbals. Breathe in deeply. Breathe out. 
and concentrate on the word of god being read to you A reading from the book of Psalms. I was glad when they said to me, "Let us go to the house of the Lord." Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city which is bound firmly together to which the tribes go up the tribes of the Lord as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord their thrones for judgment were set the thrones of the house of david pray for the peace of jerusalem may they prosper who love you peace be within your walls and security within your towers For my brethren and companions sake I will say peace be within you For the sake of the house of the Lord our God I will seek your good the word of the lord thanks be to god it was quite a steep climb to the city but the people being filled with joy and expectancy do not feel the climb and now they are within the gates their feet firmly planted in the soil of jerusalem which tribes go up why do they go up what feelings do they experience there Jerusalem is the city of peace. David knew that he would succeed in holding the tribes together only if he focused the attention of the people on God. It may have been easy for him because all the tribes believed in Yahweh. In our country the people are very diverse they speak different languages and belong to different cultures as well as different religions even so we will be able to overcome our temptation to be divided only when we make god's law of love the center of our lives let us pray that all of us indians be it maharashtrians or punjabis hindus or muslims tribals or city dwellers may discover our unity as children of god and remain united in our country
Your activity for today's lesson is to write a slogan to be written on a marble plaque for the Unity statue. Create a slogan comparing Sardar Vallabhai Patel to King David who united all tribes of Israel. Share this with your catechism teacher at the end of today's lesson. I hope students you have enjoyed today's lesson. Have a happy Sunday and see you in the next class. <music>